focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, we have our usual Wednesday reporters in Handan and Lee j i u n g Guys, welcome back. Good, Good evening. evening. Guys, we're going to start things off on the economy here. Uh, Seoul stocks ended sharply lower today. Uh, this over fears that there's going to be further U.S. rate hikes. Tan, you're going to start us off with the latest figures. Sure. South Korean stocks closed starkly lower today on worries over higher borrowing rates ahead of the release of the U.S. Federal Reserve's latest minutes. The Fed's rate hike concerns are growing amid stronger than expected economic data in the U.S. The local currency lost ground against the U.S. dollar. Korean won ended at 1,304 won against the U.S. dollar, down 9-1 from the previous session's close. This marks the first time it topped 1,301 since mid-December. The benchmark Kospi shed over 41 points, or around 1.7 percent to close at 24.17. Trading volume was moderate at around 414 million shares worth 8.2 trillion won, with losers far outpacing gainers 757 to 147. Institutions and foreign investors combined sold off a net 928 billion won worth of shares, while retail investors bought a net 887 billion won. And uh, this followed a sharp Wall Street drop overnight as investor sentiment was hurt by the prospect that the Fed might keep rates elevated for longer than feared to slow inflation. The Fed is scheduled to release its latest minutes on Wednesday. local time, which could provide clues about the U.S. monetary tightening policy down the road. Now, this amid the country's resilient economy with S&P Global Services PMI rising to over 50 percent from 46.8 in January, beating market expectations. It's the highest figure the U.S. saw in eight months. Additionally, the manufacturing PMI edged higher to 47.8. also beating market expectations. Economists at uh, S&P Global Market Intelligence assessed that February is seeing a welcome steadying of business activity after seven months of decline. Uh, But of course, the stronger than expected data is fueling concerns of further rate hikes. Back in Seoul, most top cap shares finished down. Samsung Electronics shed 1.6% to close at 6 61,101, and chip giant SK Hynix declined 2.3% to 89,101. And leading battery maker LG Energy Solution declined 2.3% to 508,001. And LG Chem shed 3% to 666,001. Samsung Biologics lost 1.5% to 788,000. And Celtrion fell 3.7% to 149,001. Bond prices, which uh, move inversely to yields, closed lower. The yield on uh, three-year Treasury rose 2.2 basis points to 3.6 percent, and the return on the benchmark five-year government bonds added 4.3 basis points to 3.6 percent. We're going to move on here. Uh, we've been talking about, uh, we actually talked about this on, I believe, on Monday, uh, the Uh, story in regards to Hybe Entertainment and uh, them taking in a large share of SM Entertainment. There's been a deepening rift between the two uh, companies and it seems like Hybe has officially become now the largest single shareholder of SM Entertainment, acquiring that 14.8% of the company. Let's get the latest details on that, j i y o u n g Sure. Now, two weeks ago, ago Hype, Hype was also known as the company behind BTS, acquiring 14.8% stake in the SM Entertainment. Um, this, he pers- they personally bought this from SM's founder, Lee Suman, in a deal worth $422.8 billion uh, won. Now, as a result, Hype became SM's largest shareholder. Now, following its acquisition of Lee Suman's SM Entertainment shares, Hype revealed in a filing that it intended to up its 14.8% stake in SM to around $4.5 
a whopping 40% of the company. Now, Hybe reportedly planned to do so by purchasing another 25.2% of SM Entertainment's shares for a total of 1.14 trillion won. Uh, now, this is from minority shareholders, and uh, it seems as though they're, they're aggressively uh, buying off these minority shares. Now, SM Entertainment's current management, however, has publicly expressed uh, opposition to Hybe's ambition. Now, over the weekend, Tang Chol Hyung Kyok, the CFO of SM Entertainment, uh, published on a video on YouTube saying that uh, slamming Hybe's recent takeover big and arguing that it would lead to the latter company's monopolization for the K-pop industry. Now, Hybe CEO Park Ji-won, on the other hand, stressed in a message sent to SM artists and their fans, saying that employees, shareholders, um, also as well, to that uh, his company respects that uh, the what the rival agencies SM. 3.0 growth strategies aim to achieve. Now, he also said that he and his team will actively support SM artists seeking chances to advance into overseas markets using the know-how and global network that they have built so far. Now, Park also said that Hybe SM Entertainment will work together to create the best company that can stand shoulder to shoulder with the world's top three major music companies. Now, with Hybe's annual revenue surpassing $1 billion mark for the second consecutive year in 2022 and buying out SM stocks, uh, finance ex experts say that Hybe's stock prices could even go up to 370,000 won. Now, this is a huge jump from the current 100. 87,700 uh, won, where they, that's the amount of uh, the what was closed today. And um, as uh, Talon said, like uh, we've seen a, a drop in a lot of companies, but Hybe was one of the few companies that saw red in the market today. So this this could happen. Yeah, and it's interesting with the Hybe stocks because I was following up on uh, Hybe Entertainment stock prices from the get-go when they first launched. Oh, really? And that, was the, that was the fun day because I went up to like 20, uh, 30% and then everyone's like, oh my goodness, this is going to go max. And then it started tanking. It went from plus 30% oh. to negative 25%. And then everyone started losing out on money and then it went downhill from there. And then BTS announced that they're going to go to the uh, the military and then it went down. And so it was actually at very, very low figures under uh, 10000 uh, 10,001, I believe. 10,001? No, sorry, 100,000, oh, sorry. Okay. Just out of curiosity, yeah. how did it end for you? Did, I didn't buy it. You're in, oh, oh, you, you didn't, didn't invest? I, I invested in YG. Uh, okay, it okay. didn't turn out too well because <laughs> Hybe was doing so well. Uh, so, yeah, but Hybe has been going up a lot, and they're saying that because Hybe Entertainment at one point was able to reach like the 400,000 won mark. So yeah. experts are saying 370,000 won. That's, I mean, that's certainly not out of reach because I think the plan for Hybe, and I think they're, they're doing this pretty well, their fear is that if every member of BTS eventually start going to the military, mm -hmm. right? And then there's, and then BTS is like the lion's share of Hybe's kind of uh, income and so forth. I mean, sure, they have like, you know, less Seraphim and other groups that I can't pronounce. Uh, but they're saying they're going to make up for that hiatus of BTS by taking over SM and the, you mm -hmm. know, the long list of great uh, artists and uh, groups that they have over there. But on the flip side, when you're saying they're trying to take 40% of a company, that's just completely taking over that entire uh, company. And so eventually, does SM even exist? After all, and so we have many messages, of course, every time we talk about this issue, we have a lot of uh, people messaging in on this. Alicia saying, no one else suspicious of hype taking over all of K-pop. Well, I mean, it, it, so far they're, they're arguing that it's not a monopoly because there's other entertainment companies out there. Uh, and the other argument is, well, there was three major companies in the first place and Hype became the fourth. And so they're just going back to three once again. But uh, it is going to get very interesting because now... It's not just SM Entertainment, Hive Entertainment. There's another entertainment company that's in the mix here because reports are trickling in that Kakao Entertainment is monitoring the market situation with the goal of listing at the end of this year or early next year. I think uh, uh, Ryder was also saying that she was actually surprised that uh, Kakao Entertainment actually did hadn't gone IPO just yet. 
Tan, did we get an official confirmation from Kakao about this? Well, Kakao Entertainment told a local, a local news outlet that it's reviewing various options, uh, but nothing has been decided yet on the company's possible listing at the end of this year. It added it'll unveil detailed plans once they are fixed. Now, a wave of attention is being drawn to the firm's possible listing as Kakao Entertainment has recently attracted an investment of $1.15 trillion won from Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund as well as the Singapore Investment Authority. And Kakao Entertainment's parent company, Kakao, when announcing that it's buying around 9% of stake in SM Entertainment, it also said that it signed an agreement with SM that allows Kakao Entertainment to use their expertise in tech entertainment and music to produce new K-pop artists and run global businesses. Kakao bought the 9% stake of SM Entertainment for around 217 billion won to become the second largest shareholder of the K-pop company, uh, it said on Tuesday. The tech giant bought 1.23 million newly issued shares at 91,000 won per share and around 105 billion won of convertible bonds, which will give Kakao over 1.1 million additional shares. Kakao Entertainment, the tech company's content subsidiary, owns Edam Entertainment, home to singer and actor IU, Starship Entertainment, agency of girl group I and boy band Monster X, IST Entertainment, which manages boy bands The Boys, ATBO, and Victon, and girl groups A Pink and Weekly, uh, as well as High Up Entertainment, which is uh, signed with girl group Stacy, as well as Antenna, home to major actors and ballad singers, which recently signed with singer Ihyo Ri. So we can see that Kakao Entertainment's involvement yeah, in its yeah. label's music uh, is even more discreet than Hybe. Some K-pop fans, including myself, uh, are unaware that all of, all, all of these aforementioned companies have been acquired by Kakao Entertainment because the company has kept such a low profile. Yeah, I didn't know this neither. Right. Yeah. So the company company uh, appears to be uh, focusing on distribution and marketing strategies for now. Yeah, there's a lot of and that that's actually a surprise. Even Antenna is actually a kind of a big surprise for me because Antenna is the other really well-known uh, entertainment company right there. Not only do they have uh, EOD, but they have like Yuje Suk, mm -hmm. I believe, who is probably arguably one of the top MCs in uh, Korea. Um, interesting comment here. Jenga says, uh, I think Disney might be the closest thing to what the US has, right? Well, Kind of different in that, like Disney took up, like for example, they bought out um, what is it, Pixar, uh, and then they bought out ESPN. Uh, they bought out a number of different channels, and they're kind of eating it up. And if you look at uh, you know Disney Plus, their uh, OTT platform, you have all these like uh, you know programs from like. Uh, what is it? They also like all the Disney stuff, all the uh, the, the Star Wars stuff, all the the ESPN sports stuff, and all the the HBO stuff. And so they yeah they're buying out everything. Everyone's saying like yeah Disney's really monopolizing everything. Uh, but uh, we we could potentially be seeing I guess something uh, there's uh, similar to what uh, uh, Hive Entertainment is doing right now. Nevertheless, I'm sure this is not the last time we'll be talking about this. Moving on, more economic news here. As inflation, high interest rates, and job insecurity overlapped, people across the country have felt distress, and the numbers show that January recorded an all-time high. Uh, Ching, let's get the latest figures on that. Uh, sure. Now, South Korea's misery index in January climbed to a record high for the first time uh, in, in years. And now, to, just to tell you what the misery index is, it's a, a measure of economic distress felt by everyday people uh, due to the risk of joblessness combined with an increasing cost of living. Now, the misery index is calculated by adding the seasonally adjusted unemployment rate to the inflation rate. Now, citing data from Statistics Korea on Tuesday, uh, main opposition Democratic Party lawmaker Kim Hye-jae uh, reported that the misery index in South Korea reached 8.8 .8 last month, which is the highest January mark since the unemployment rate was revised in June 1999. Um, the unemployment rate is, to be honest, usually higher in January than other 
months. And it's also a time when essential living expenses, such as heating costs, increase. But this number has been the lowest of the lows, even if you include the recession in 2008. And also last month, the unemployment rate marked 3.6 percent, while inflation hit 5.2. The previous record for the month of January that was low was in uh, 2010 when the index marked 8.5 percent with the unemployment rate at 5 percent and inflation at 3.5 percent. So uh, we're seeing um, a lot of people struggling and we can see it in these numbers. Yeah, I mean, what we basically have right now is the perfect storm, right? Mm -hmm. So you have high unemployment numbers, you have high inflation, you have high interest rates. uh, And uh, I mean, not surprising that we have a record high uh, figures when it comes to misery index. And I I think a lot of us could certainly feel that uh, at this time. Uh, And uh, especially for like the younger, the 20s, right? And the 20s and 30s are the ones that are feeling, I I think, the brunt of this at this time. And so whether or not, again, every time we, when we compare to things that happened in like 2008, you know, it's very concerning. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, in the meantime, the government launching a task force today uh, to study the ways to break the uh, oligopoly of Korea's major commercial banks. We've been talking about this for some weeks now. Uh, today's meetings came just days after President Yoon suk yeol called on lenders to help curb the cost of living burden on vulnerable people. Don, let's get the latest on this. Sure. President Yoon made it very clear in recent days that banks serve the public interest, and so they do have the duty to redistribute wealth. And against such backdrop, a panel headed by the deputy chief of the top financial regulator later, the Financial Services Commission Kim So-young discussed ways today to look into specific ways to break the oligopoly of the country's top five banks. Kim said at the panel's inaugural meeting today that it would study ways to boost competition either between existing banks or by allowing entries of niche service providers. He said that in order to promote competition in the banking sector, banking business authorization will be subdivided into small licenses and the so-called challenger banks will be introduced to diversify types of banks. Challenger banks include those such as internet-only banks or banks that have converged with fintech. Uh, So the government strongly believes that competition uh, will break the current oligopoly system dominated by just a handful of commercial banks. Uh, And uh, it's hoping that it will pave the way for the emergence of a large number of independent banks as well, giving financial consumers a variety of options. Uh, For instance, banks specializing in small businesses or wholesale and retail specialized banks or banks specializing in small and mid-sized enterprises could emerge. And that is what the government is aiming for. The panel uh, would also look into ways to help banks diversify their business practices, currently heavily dependent on interest rate margins uh, and improve their pay structure. And the task force would also discuss possible measures to strengthen capital buffers against external shocks. Today's meeting was attended by members of the Financial Supervisory Service, the Federation of Banks, Life Insurance Association, Financial Investment Association, and other major financial institutions and regulators. Financial Supervisory Service Governor Yi Bo-kyun said at a separate meeting with foreign investors today that by doing so, by studying all these different kind of measures to boost competition, Korea's banking industry will be able to get more competitive and efficient, which will make the Korean and financial markets more attractive to investors as well. Meanwhile, amid growing public discontent over reports of big performance sharing and early retirement bonus payments by banks, major banks have been lowering lending rates. Uh, KB Kumin Bank said it'll cut the mortgage rate and rates on loans for Chunse by up to 0.55 percentage points starting February 28th. Uri Bank inched down mortgage rate for a five-year loan by 0.2 percentage points, while Shinhan and Hana Bank are are both reviewing the possibility of lowering the rate as well. And the movement also spread to Internet-only banks. Kakao Bank cut the interest rate for unsecured loans by up to 0.7 percentage points uh, to an annual 4.29 percent starting Tuesday. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this, but uh, there was also a lot of people who are saying, well, it's 
you know, kudos to them for cutting half a percentage point on the uh, the interest rates, but it's still not enough because it's still relatively high, right? So when you have like a high interest rate and you're only taking out a half a percentage point, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference is what they're saying. But it's also kind of tough with like banks is because when the when the consumers have a choice in what banks they want to use, right? You When it comes to like money, you want to kind of... Uh, use the bank that is well established. Mm. You want to use the bank that's big, right? And then that a you lot can of trust. Yeah, exactly. And I think the big uh, argument that was made is before is even if like these smaller savings banks or like smaller banks kind of offer like really high interest rates mm. on deposits, um, they take, for example, as an example, I don't know if you guys remember the Tomato Tomato Savings Bank. Yeah, yeah I remember that. back in the day, it was yeah, huge. Right? And a that lot was of people lost. A lot of their fortune. 2010, I believe, 2009 mm-hmm. or 2000, it might be 2011, I think, something like that. And it was at the time, Tomato a Savings Bank had really, really high interest turnover mm, right. rates. And so everyone was going into that. Mm-hmm. And then everyone lost their money because they couldn't uh, give, back, give back the money. And so mm-hmm. a lot of people learned from that and said, they're never going to, no matter how high the return is, they're never going to go back to these smaller uh, banks. And which is why you saw. Uh, rise in some of the major banks like you know KB and Chinan uh, and so forth and so I don't know whether or not this is going to change the the way that the consumers are going to respond to which banks they use but we'll see what happens moving forward here moving on Korean Air was in the hot seat after they announced their plans to revamp their mileage redemption system from region based to distance based now this would force customers to spend more miles on tickets which uh obviously received a huge backlash from the consumer. So that's why Korean Air is now reviewing the new distance-based mileage program once again. ji tell us more about this. Sure. Now, on Wednesday, Korean Air uh, again announced that they will review its new distance-based mileage program, which was scheduled to take effect on April 1st. Now, currently, uh, the mileage is deducted for one domestic flight and four international flight regions. One is Northeast Asia, one is Southeast Asia, another is uh, the Americas and Europe and Oceania. Now, but with the distance-based redemption system, this policy would require long-distance travelers to spend more mileage on certain routes. For example, for a one-way flight between Incheon to New York, the redemption was expected to rise 28.5% to uh, 45,000 miles compared to the current 35,000 miles needed for an economy seat. Now, as you mentioned, the previous plan received a huge backlash from consumers and also criticism from the government, um, especially from Minister of Land, Infrastructure and Transportation, Won Yidong, uh, who oversees aviation affairs. Now, Won Yidong said that even though Korean hit air hit an all-time record high profits in recent years due to its cargo, uh, the airline is neglecting its customers, um, also describing the program as being all flash and no substance. So Korean Air said that it will review the mileage program update and also new VIP membership program and will be running the current region-based mileage program until further notice. Now, aside from the review, the airline plans to implement policies that allow passengers to better utilize their mileage, such as providing more mileage seats, running mileage discount promotion sales, and allowing uh, mileage to be used in a wider range of services, including in-flight duty-free shopping, and also for its sister budget carrier known as Jin Air. Yeah, uh, the the redemption system was something that was uh, criticized for a really long time because I remember Mm -hmm. uh, I had something like, 28,000 miles or something mm-hmm. like that. And at the time, that was good enough for a, uh, a trip from uh, Incheon International Airport to Jennifer, John F. Kennedy in New York. And then they mm-hmm. changed it to 35. And I was like, I can't even use this anymore. And I, I don't can't add any more miles anymore. And mm-hmm. now they're going to increase it even more. To 45, yeah. But they, they scrapped that for, for now until they find a better system. But uh, they just really haven't figured out what would be beneficial for them and also the consumers. Yeah, I don't see myself adding another 7,000 miles anytime soon. So Mm -hmm. there you have it. Uh, In the meantime, let's move on here. Defense Minister of South Korea, the UAE, holding talks over in Abu Dhabi, uh, where they agreed to expand military cooperation, including joint weapons development. 
Tana, let's get the key takeaways from that meeting. Right. South Korean Defense Minister Lee jong sub and his Emirati counterpart Mohammed Ahmed Al-Bawardi discussed defense and arms industry cooperation, among other pending issues. The bilateral defense ministerial meeting followed President Yoon sung yeols state visit to the UAE for a summit with his counterpart Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed al Nayyan in uh, last month. So at the top of the agenda was concrete ways to implement the agreements made between the two leaders. They agreed to explore ways to expand bilateral cooperation in jointly developing and producing weapons based on the memorandums of understanding on strategic defense industry cooperation and on the joint development of uh, multi-role cargo aircraft signed after the summit. South Korea's uh, defense ministry said that both sides agreed on cooperation in the fields of joint investment, research and technological development. And in particular, they committed to identifying requirements for new weapon systems that can be jointly developed and produced as potential areas for joint research. The two military leaders also vowed to boost ties in the fields of cyber security space and realistic training exercises conducted with cutting-edge simulation combat systems. Uh, They also noted that the UAE is the only foreign country where South Korea has dispatched an overseas unit for the purpose of military cooperation. The AK unit, which Lee visited on Sunday, has been carrying out various missions, including uh, providing education and training for the Emirati Special Forces and conducting combined exercises with the Emirati Special Forces in Abu Dhabi since its establishment in 2011. Al Bawardi re- reportedly said uh, that the AK unit, which is a symbol of defense cooperation between the two countries, has been instrumental in strengthening the combat capabilities of the Emirati Armed Forces. AK means brother in Arabic. Following the talks, Lee jong visited a UAE military unit in Abu Dhabi that operates the South Korean-made Cheonggung-2 mid-range surface-to-air missile system and encouraged the troops there. Moving on to other military news this time. If you guys remember something that we talked about uh, back in September of last year, Poland signed a contract to purchase 48 light attack aircraft from South Korea. Now, flight training for our Polish uh, pilots on the F-A-50 started today. Jean, let's get the details of that. Sure. Now, the South Korean Air Force held a commencement ceremony for four Polish pilots who will operate the F-A-50 at the first fighter wing. And um, also, they started their training. Now, as you mentioned, Poland's Ministry of National Defense signed two ca- contracts to buy 48 F-A-50 light attack aircraft from South Korea, uh, with the first 12 jets to be delivered this year and a further 36 aircraft in the years uh, from 2025 to 2028. Now, shortly after Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, the government in neighboring Poland passed a law to more than doubled the size of its military and went shopping for uh, weapons. And Poland's 2023 defense allocation has risen more than twofold from last year. And also in total, the government says that it will spend 4% of its GDP on defense this year. So um, now these pilots will be receiving training for 11 weeks with Korean Air Force pilots assigned individually from the first fighter wing. And after that, they will ride the F-A-50 simulator for a week and return to Poland after completing flight flight mastery training on the ground. Let's move on here. Uh, We had um, two pretty big speeches uh, from two major world leaders. Uh, We had uh, U.S. President Joe Biden uh, holding a speech in uh, Warsaw, I believe, and uh, you had uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin having his uh, State of the Nation address. Uh, What's interesting is uh, the two leaders had uh, 
very, very different stances and projections in the ongoing conflict over in Ukraine. Uh, obviously, these uh, speeches coming uh, with the uh, the one year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, just uh, a few days away now. 24th is the exact one year. Uh, let's talk about their speeches here and their differences. Uh, Tan, you have the details of this. Right. They could not have been further apart in their interpretations of the past year its causes, consequences, and predictions on how things will unfold from this point on. They did, however, seem to agree that this is a war intended to remain on the territory of Ukraine, but is being elevated into something far wider, a battle of survival between the West and Russia. President Putin, during his State of the Nation address, accused Western countries of igniting and sustaining the war in Ukraine, dismissing any blame for Moscow almost a year after the Kremlin's unprovoked invasion of its neighbor that has killed tens of thousands of people. Putin accused the West of launching aggressive information attacks and taking aim at Russian culture, religion, and values because it is aware that it's impossible to defeat Russia on the battlefield. He also accused Western nations of waging an attack on Russia's economy with sanctions, uh, but declared that they hadn't achieved anything and will not achieve anything. He also announced that Russia is suspending its participation in the New START nuclear arms reduction treaty, the last remaining arms control agreement uh, governing the world's two largest nuclear arsenals. The Kremlin leader, uh, however, added that Russia is not withdrawing from the treaty entirely, uh, but is suspending participation. But he alluded to his remarks on arms control with a lengthy uh, uh, speech about the West's alleged aims in providing aid to Ukraine. Meanwhile, just hours after Putin's address, U.S. President Biden rejected Putin's claim that the war in Ukraine was started by the West. After landing in Poland, his next stop following his symbolic visit to Ukraine, he said this was a war of choice, not necessarily started by one man and could easily end with one word. He also stressed that Putin was wrong to think the world would roll over and that Ukraine was weak and that the West was divided, hailing NATO's rock-solid unity. He added that Kyiv uh, stood strong proud, tall, and free, and Western support for Ukraine would not fail. The U.S. leader delivered strong words uh, that a dictator bent on rebuilding an empire will never be able to ease the people's love of liberty, and that brutality will never grind down the will of the free. And he said that Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. I think uh, the one thing that really stood out, again, uh, going back to uh, Putin's speech, is that uh, his suspension of the uh, the New Star Treaty. Um, but it is uh, there was one part of that speech that I found quite, quite interesting. It's basically, basically, he said, now that this they're suspending this, uh, he said. Russia now has no choice, uh, considering the geopolitical tensions right now, that they would need to start testing their nuclear weapons. But, he said, uh, they will only do so if the U.S. goes ahead and uh, tests nuclear weapons first. Now, right. I don't know what that means, but what we took it as is now Russia is willing to start, you know, testing nuclear weapons, and it's not going to be very good when they start doing this. Um, but it's... I, Two, like you said, I mean, there's two very different uh, arguments being made in regards to who started first. I mean, you can kind of tell what uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin is trying to say. He's saying, well, if there was no uh, NATO uh, influence being expanded closer and closer to Russia, and, you know, they're basically saying this all started with Ukraine kind of trying to join NATO and things like that. And part of their treaty before the uh, agreement was that NATO doesn't expand further and they're trying to use like Ukraine as a buffer zone and things like that. And so they're saying it's their fault. But I mean, ultimately, it is Russia's fault for invading uh, Ukraine is what it is. But it, it's there was a lot of analysis into Putin's speeches, and they're saying that a lot of it didn't make sense. Uh, you could tell that those that uh, attended the state of the uh, the nation address were like the, the elites and the uh, the, the law lawmakers and the, the the military, the high ranking military men who are kind of forced to sta sit there and of course given the uh, the standing ovations and things like that. But they're saying it seems like right now experts are saying. Putin is now running out of options right now. 
Um, it seems like it's caught a, uh, caught a dead end. Uh, the last thing he could do, the only thing he could do right now is convince the people that they're actually winning this uh, war and that it's a war that was not started by them because now a lot of people in, inside Russia is blaming Putin for the economy, the economic crisis that they're going in because of the crippling sanctions put in place. So now they're saying Putin might be cornered. But is it always good to corner someone like Putin is the other question, especially when he's now talking about nuclear weapons exactly. and things like that, right? So scary stuff here. Again, uh, almost marking that one year. I can't believe it's been almost a year since the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we'll get an expert's take on this tomorrow in our tomorrow's program. So do st tune in for that. Uh, let's move on now, get some more updates on the Turkey-Syria earthquakes only two weeks after the region was devastated by the massive earthquake so we had that 6.3 magnitude earthquake that hit the same region earlier on monday Jiang, uh, let's get the latest updates in regards to this. Sure. Now, regarding the 6.3 magnitude earthquake that was hit on Monday, uh, six people were killed um, in the region of Turkey, uh, the border region of Turkey and Syria, uh, which was, as you mentioned, two weeks after a ma massive quake hit more, killed more than 40,000 people and damaged or destroyed hundreds of thousands of homes. Now, Monday's quake struck just as the West rescue work from the initial devastating earthquake was windowing down and was centered near the Turkish city of Ant Antakya and was felt in Syria, Egypt, and Lebanon. Now, the magnitude of the quake was measured at 6.3 by U.S. and European geological agencies and 6.4 by Turkish monitors. Now, it was followed also by 90 aftershocks, adding fresh trauma to Antakya residents, left leaving them homeless and also living in tents by the magnitude of 7.8 earthquake, which was hit on February 6. Now, this shows how the lethal danger from earthquake can continue long after the few seconds of the first one. So uh, this isn't the end, and we'll see more of the aftershock and some more quakes coming uh, from in, in this region. Yeah, and this is the, uh, the interesting thing is is like it's not the first time we've heard of these massive earthquakes in the past right mm -hmm. i mean we've heard of like seven plus magnitude eight plus magnitudes before but mm -hmm. turkey and uh, syria is kind of in that region we had an expert talk about this where there's three different faults i believe coming together mm -hmm. uh and so in other regions like when they talk about like uh, peru had a big uh earthquake not too long ago and it does it's not met with like thousands of aftershocks afterwards but because turkey and syria is kind of in this weird fault line. Mm -hmm. uh, you have thousands of uh, aftershocks, which the most concerning thing was them saying, experts saying it might last years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's ridiculous. I've never seen anything like this. And hopefully uh, things settle down because all these aftershocks are really sl are slowing down. I think what's going to be a very, very long reconstruction process that's going to have to follow after this. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, guys, as always, thank you very much for your reports today. Please stay safe and we'll see you guys again. Thank, thank you. you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.